This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for Resolve dash masterclass. Well, that was a great lead in. That was a great, (laughs) that was, was I I think we can wrap it. How (laughs) appropriate. Listen, what we'd like to tell you to do is go listen to that and you can capture everything that we're going to talk about today. Exactly. I'm just kidding. (laughs) We would never let you off that easy on a Friday afternoon. You are stuck with us. If you tuned in, I'm sorry. That's your fault, not mine. Um, And with that, welcome, I guess. Yeah, welcome. 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 And also, you know, we're going to have an investment discussion on stuff and you should get professional advice, do your own research, all of those things. Think for yourself on all a number of uh, myriad options and topics. But today we're going to dig in or re-dig in to um, content that we've kind of prepared a couple of times. I think it was was probably five years ago in in a cheeky way. We did the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, and the 12 Days of Investment Wisdom and walk that through December, which was a bit of fun. Oh, good. Mike, you just went you just went silent on us. Unhit the mute button. <laughs> All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, so the, the cable jiggled. Jiggle the cable doesn't always work. Sometimes it cuts out your audio. Um, so the little history on the masterclass was we did it and then we kind of thought about it, but we could make it more succinct, make it in a 10 sort of thoughtful mini content pieces on how you would think about long lived assets, like potentially permanent assets and how that changes your mindset when you're thinking about things. And I, I remember when we first did this, it's kind of reminiscent of living in a, in a tropical island or paradise that, that we live in. And thinking about where you might buy a house. And if you're here for five years or 10 years, you might think about buying something right on the seashore and risking it, buying some insurance, and maybe a hurricane hits and maybe it doesn't. But if you're a founding family that's lived here for 100 years and will continue to live here, you're probably thinking about where's the highest spot? Where's it inland a little bit? Because I'm going to be here for the long term. And I think thinking about your portfolio through that lens when you're thinking about, you know, 50 or multi-decade timeframes alters a little bit of what your preferences might be. And so the masterclass and the evolution of the masterclass was to just sit down and think through that. And it's a it's a great piece of of thought just to, you know, kind of inform your own preferences. And with that, I mean, I guess I'll turn it over to you guys to chime in. I feel like I've talked for a little bit here, so. Yeah, no, it's it's all good, and I'll I'll actually quickly share the screen so that um, so that people can see how the content is laid out uh, on. If you wouldn't mind pushing that through, so if you go to investorsolve.com forward slash masterclass, what you'll see is it's a ten episode series laid out starting from the how to steward long lived wealth, as Mike just alluded to, decision making, preparation before prediction balance, rebalancing premium, and so on. We get into alpha, we get into tail protection, and putting it all together. Each one of these has transcripts to it, but uh, we're going to try to summarize all of that for you today and um, and also talk a little bit about how this has worked out in the last, in, from the pandemic to the, um, the inflationary regime that we saw last year. But really, all of this that we've put together comes from, you know, especially from this group, uh, our own kind of personal experience, right? We're, we all kind of got to the same place through different ways. And what we talk about in the masterclass a little bit is, um, is the idea of uh, like proper decision making and how difficult it is to predict the future. But uh, I think, you know, I really like our, like each individual background. I mean, why don't we start you with, with you, Richard, because uh, you, you're the last one to experience the transition, um, where you came from and how you ended up with a, a shop that doesn't really 
uh, care much about any single asset class, but cares about the diversity of it all. You started pretty, in a pretty concentrated way, did you not? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, most of my career focused in equities in the Brazilian market. That's where I'm from originally. And uh, when I arrived at Resolve, you guys were already deep into the research and into the framework that we call the adaptive asset allocation and the the alpha stack that we now call it the evolution uh, uh, program was was coming uh, online and it, it was starting to, uh, to to become what it has become. And then for me, uh, I really was uh, through the journey focused in, in valuations and focusing on multiples and focusing on kind of really understanding the micro uh, of the companies uh, that we that we invested in, in in the two places that I mostly focused my career on the buy side in Brazil. And then I remember the period between 2014 and 2016 where we had presidential elections uh, where uh, a fall of, of a, uh, there was a plane crash where one of the main candidates uh, passed away and huge swings in the market. And then following that, we had, you know, blog posts and political gossip generating five to 10% swings in the main Brazilian uh, index of Ibo Vespa, which was kind of in hindsight, like, bonkers like you, you, you can't even imagine nowadays investing having to all of us i remember in the 2014 period having to go into these blogs and kind of understand where the alpha was in trying to predict the political outcome and following that uh an impeachment process and then a new president coming in and after all that i was really i was really ready to receive this kind of wisdom this new way to think about an investment framework not only from a diversified approach, not like globally diversified and asset class uh, diversification, but also a systematic way to think about allocations, right? Not not really relying on your gut or this illusion of control that one has, uh, like knowing intimately uh, the balance sheet and the income statement of a company and kind of <laughs> under thinking that you know what the outcome is going to be, or but but rather having this more more thoughtful approach where you're trying to triangulate uh, on the outcome of asset classes by drawing from multiple perspective and, and multiple sources of information, price driven, some of them historical, uh, seasonality, things like that. So, so it really was a, a come to Jesus moment. Uh, once I started reading our, our content and I, I knew that this was, uh, this was what I wanted to do. Yeah. And, and most of us have already talk about our origins, right? Mine is Peru, inflationary boom that led to a lot of money. We've got millions, oh, we've got millions of new listeners though. Yeah, go through yeah, it. Sure. We've got, it's a good story. No, so the way, the way I came died. through it, yeah, that we got the millions. I forgot about the give me, millions. Give me the, don't, um, don't give me this. I want emotion. I want saliency. So look, it's, I think Richard can attest to how difficult it is to, to think about, you know, predicting anything in the Latin American market, but you know, my background is born and raised in Peru. My father was a very um, sophisticated mathematician. He was a software developer. He, he actually brought the first computer to Peru after studying in Monterey, California for the Peruvian Navy in operations research. Operations research something that kind of informs a lot of what we do today, which is interesting. Um, built a little business, and in 1989, inflation went from 20% to 7,200%, and it was just absolute chaos, right? A period where anybody who had savings and cash went to zero in terms of purchasing power. And my next door neighbor who had a, a mortgage and was about to get evicted was able to pay off his mortgage with a hundred dollar bill. Right? It was like big losers, big winners. The big winners were the debtors. Uh, emigrated to Canada by another concentrated position, which was real estate right before a 50 percent housing market crash. And then once again, we saw it again in 1998 to 2000 uh, during the tech crisis where you, you invested in the stock market, mostly tech, and got a massive bear market. And all that led to concentrated bets from a very intelligent man that um, just didn't understand how markets work. So it, it led me down a path of how do I make sure that that does not happen to me? And it all starts with first understanding that asset allocation is more important than security selection. And everybody I spoke to at the time was picking stocks, not picking asset classes. And it was about diversity globally. And then it's about systematic investing rather than emotional investing, right? I think 
I'm pretty bad at the emotional side, so it was a perfect framework for me to go down and, and use as I graduated from Rotman and finance and statistics and then and started my own business before I met Mike and Adam. And, and I think around that same time, uh, Mike, you and, and Adam went through a, your own come to Jesus moment. Mine was led by my family, but you guys had a transition. We talked in the, in the what masterclass about Philip Tetlock. So I don't know who wants to go first, because I think you both kind of got there at the same time. Well, I think, um, yeah, that's a good segue, because I was thinking to myself, you know, there were lessons learned by all of us, I think, in our own ways. Many of us who started out being really keen, interested in finance, started out in stock picking, because let's face it, that that is really fun. It's really interesting to dig into the details of, of potential new growth opportunities and new technology and um, you know, just, just do a deep dive into the fundamentals. I mean, once for a data oriented person, uh, the, the richness of the data ecosystem for equities is just, uh, almost irresistible. Right. And I think that's where the vast majority of people sort of start on their journey in investing. And I think one of the big challenges is that, that most people kind of don't ever move off that. Right. Uh, or many people don't ever kind of move away from just that passion for equities, and so they miss out on the rich diversity of other opportunities that um, often operate in ways that are completely independent of what's going on in equities and therefore, you know, offer a huge uh, set of potential profit uh, orientations if you could just broaden your horizon, right? So that was one big thing. Just move off stocks, right? Move off zero in, in other asset classes. But the other piece of this is the systematic decision making, right? Um, and I think some people may perceive the way you kind of set it up as a bit of a straw man, right? Like systematic versus emotional. I think a lot of people who apply discretionary methods of um, investment allocation think that they are doing things rationally, right? They're not being driven by emotion, that they're they're running analyses, maybe it's stock screens or um, deep dives in terms of projecting future cash flows out many years, weighted average cost of capital, et cetera. And they're leaning on their models in order to make these kinds of decisions, right? The, the reality is, or the difference between even people who are um, putting in that level of analysis versus um, systematic investing is that a systematic investor puts all of the analysis in to the process. So what is the process that I'm going to use to invest? If um, my investment process is gonna be largely passive, then that is upfront, well, what is the strategic asset allocation, the mix of stock bonds and potentially other asset classes and risk premia that are most likely to deliver on my, uh, my investment objectives? Um, and for more active investors, it is what is the process that I'm going to use every time to select the group of assets and the weights of those assets and how often I'm going to rebalance them in a portfolio. And then the one of the, the great benefits of systematic investing is that if you do it right, you can go back and see how that process would have played out in terms of investment performance over hopefully many decades and many different economic cycles and economic regimes, right? Different inflation environments, growth environments, liquidity environments, et cetera, right? So that's one of the big big advantages of systematic. And it's, it's nuanced, but I think there's a very clear difference between people who are highly analytical, but still apply a discretionary process, no matter how rational they are on an ongoing basis, and people that apply a systematic process where all of the effort goes into the design of the process. And then over time, you largely let that process run on its own, obviously monitoring the economy and the universe of assets that you're allocating to, to make sure that there's nothing really strange going on, that the um, information that you're using to inform your models aren't aware of, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I, I didn't come to this automatically. I spent probably the first third of my investment career um, in the more analytical but discretionary orientation. And um, I didn't really learn the 
hard lessons that motivated a shift to a, a pure sort of systematic mindset until the latter half of 2008, because I had largely navigated the macro environment using a discretionary process through this sort of knots, emphasizing commodities and emerging markets, et cetera. I, I had been following and recognizing a lot of the risks that were piling up in the housing market and in the credit sector and in the banking sector going into the 2008 crisis. But what really woke me up to the complexity of this investment um, uh, ecosystem or, or activity that we're all involved in is the reflexivity that we observed when governments began to get involved very heavily later in 2008 and especially early in 2009 by just changing the rules of the game on the fly. And so, you know, that was a really big frying pan to the face. Yeah, okay, you can have the macro environment uh, dead to rights. You can know exactly where the nexus of risk is. You can have the right trades on to capitalize on that. But there are other entities in the market that have very large incentives and very large balance sheets. In other words, they've got really big guns that they can bring to bear to change the outcome very dramatically um, and, and, and shift the, the, the um, directions of risk. And so coming out of that, um, that's what sort of led me. If, if I'm going to continue in this business, then I need to take on this, you know, a systematic mindset. Now, I've rambled, rambled on for quite a while. So if someone else wants to take on the, the Tetlock story, then I'm happy to yield the mic. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think, yeah, one of the things that was, um, this probably actually runs along the same sides as, as what happened to Philip Tetlock as he, uh, through his academic career, achieved um, tenureship and had the ability to direct research. And prior to that, sort of seeing decision making happen, and this is detailed in his book, Expert Political Judgment, just looking at these uh, experts in certain fields. And there's, I think it's, you know, over, it's like 28,000 observations over 10 years. It's either 28 or 82. I'm just, so forgive me for that. Um, so, so what he found was, you know, experts featured on media are particularly bad. Um, experts in their field aren't really great either. What works is sort of simple models, which is an interesting tweet that Rodrigo uh, retweeted with the inverse, uh, what's his name on CNBC model. Jim Cramer is Kramer's a new Jim, inverse, inverse, inverse of Kramer whatever model. Jim Kramer yeah. bets, yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting and funny thing because I think you're harnessing the risk premia, which is a behavioral risk premia of those in the media having poor track records at predicting the future. And this is an interesting thing. Once you declare behaviorally a position, you now have to defend that position. And I'll often say when I'm in a conversation, wait, how did I get in the corner painted defending this position? Well, because you said it. Oh, damn it. Did say that. <laughs> so now I have to defend it. So this is, a, is as, as Adam alludes, it's, it's nuanced. And I think, so the journey for me was always, I was a little bit more, um, always kind of looking for rules to help me sort of navigate my decision-making. And I think the crucible to get us across to a much more, uh, to, to make the commitment uh, both financially and across the, the firm and a research perspective to move to a more systematic decision-making process was that desire all along and just seeing that, you know, the, the fat Tony in me, um, reference from um, Taleb, just always kind of looks sideways. There's a lot of experts. There's a lot of experts saying a lot of things and they're, you know, constantly sort of random at best. So, you know, when you think about th those types of concepts, then you start to think about, well, wait a second, maybe preparation is better than prediction or Let's think about having a fully prepared portfolio. That's the first part. And then we can now measure our tilts or the things that we think are going to add value. And I say we as the investment community, the things that we that might add value to that, the tilts, active allocations, home country bias, we can actually measure them against some sort of base portfolio. So first, let's have a fully prepared portfolio. And this is where we sort of all circled around the idea of some sort of risk parity concept where you're thinking about the amount of risk you're taking rather than the amount of capital that you're allocating. 
let's not let the maniacs run the asylum. I mean, you know, stocks have a volatility of 20, bonds have a volatility of six. There's a there's a vague there's a vague there between those two that's quite large. And so capital allocating doesn't quite quite you know hit the target. So I think we we said let's be prepared. What's the best prepared portfolio? And that's sort of something in the area of risk parity. Now there's many, many ways to construct that and think about that. And there's a great, you know, there's a great paper that um, Adam penned, which is sort of the decision making tree that goes through what do you believe? And then this is how you can, should construct your portfolio. Yeah. And what can, I, what know, do you think you can measure? You, can you measure yeah. volatility? Can you measure correlations? Yeah. Do you have the ability to predict yeah. the future returns of something? You know, that'll, that'll, yeah. Whatever you believe you can accomplish, you'll be able to do. Right. And, and that's highly yeah. informative to how you might think down the road in constructing a portfolio. We sort of circled around the idea, well, let's wrap our, hand, our arms around all of the assets in the world. Let's let everybody fight over, you know, today gold's hot, tomorrow bonds are hot, et cetera. But we're balancing the risk between these different areas. And Rod, you always do a great job yeah. of summarizing this, you know. Why, why so, don't you, I'll yeah, pass so just it quickly, to you. I why mean, bonds, the, why stocks, why commodities? Well, the, the, why going bonds? back to my personal experience, right? It, it is what your group of investors are used to. In Latin America, what your group of investors were used to is leaving everything in a, in a safe a uh, checking account or savings account in, a Peruvian, mm -hmm. in, the, in the safest Peruvian bank, right? That That is considered safe, but cash is only safe if inflation doesn't go through the roof, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in North America, when I when I graduated and started interviewing advisors, what is considered safe has been the 60% equity, 40% portfolio, right? 60, 40. From, if you put your risk parity goggles on and you x-ray that portfolio, you may think you're getting 60% of equity risk and 40% a bond risk, but in reality, you're getting over 90% of risk in equities and, and less than 10% of risk from bonds. So it's wildly inappropriate, right? That means that nine out of 10 days, if we trade that portfolio over the next 10 days and equities are down all 10 days and bonds are up all 10 days, your 60-40 portfolio will be down nine out of those 10 days. That is not balanced at all, right? So you need to go the other way if you want to create that balance, right? You want to have significantly more equities more sorry, more bonds, 70 to 80 percent and less equities. But the problem there with that portfolio, the way I saw it as a Latin American is, well, what happens when inflation goes up? Right. That's when rates are going to go up and equities and bonds are going to go down. There's something missing there. And that missing piece is something that does really well as uh, as inflation goes up. That tends to be tips. That tends to be commodities. And that's been missing in portfolios for as long as I can remember, right? We've only just started talking about inflation hedges after the fact, as it always happens, right? And so, you know, my dad was working with a single piston every single time in a motor, right? He had a single piston kind of chugging him along in his growth trajectory. But I got to North America and people had two pistons in their motor. One was really thick and the other one was really small. So it was like a clunky engine that kind of moved differently, but didn't actually give him a smooth ride. And then what we talk about about risk parity is first and foremost diversity, having things that can do well in different regimes, equities for growth, bonds for bear, bear markets that are non-inflationary, and commodities for inflationary regime or tips, and then weight them in such a way where your motor is actually three separate pistons that are equal width so that the ride is a lot smoother. Right now, it's we're going to talk about this. This is the, what, the first part of the master class. We talk about getting a smoother ride if your only option is to be long only. But it is at the very least that is a motor that we can put together where we don't have to predict which piston is going to be firing off at any given time. Where we're going to move forward most of the time, and and we're going to kind of survive the storms. Right. So that is the, the, the first portion of risk parity. to this that I think is always important, and and we can talk about all the technical aspects and the, 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 the basis that underpins this framework. But from a behavioral standpoint, it really is a, an explicit recognition of ignorance, right? It, it, it's accepting that there's so much uncertainty the out there and that we want to sort of, as we like to say, first do no harm. And, and everybody likes to have that illusion of control, especially in our industry, because confidence slash hubris sells. And you're able to say, I know, and, and, and this also kind of applies to, to uh, ensemble methods, which we will we'll get to in a moment, right? Triangulating or, or around uh, an answer 
to to multiple questions, but explicitly on risk parity, right? This this understanding that first you want to do no harm, and so if you have a blank canvas, and you want to start an asset allocation, a portfolio construction methodology, how would you start there? Well, you want to participate in capitalism and growth and human ingenuity and all those aspects. And how do you want to do that? Well, you want to do it in a balanced way. So the maniacs don't take over the asylum that no single asset class can dominate the portfolio from a risk perspective. And so you create this, this portfolio that is well-rounded geographically from a regime standpoint, and then has that uh, uh, yeah. risk balance to it. But for a lot of people, they 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 want to gravitate towards people that have. It's like the that meme that I always like: uh, uh, simple but wrong answers, and hard, uh, 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 correct but difficult uh, explanations. And there's only a couple of people on the on the latter line, and everybody gravitates to the well, former, right? I, it, no one really wants to embrace that uncertainty to the degree. So they just want to, they just want someone that tells them, I have an answer and and come with me. I'll, I'll, I'll take you along for the ride. Look, it may seem hypocritical for us to be, we talk so much about the, the do no harm portfolio or the, you know, in, in, in having a level of, of humility about the market, given that we run a pure alpha, you know, that's trying to predict the future over the next five days. But I think the point that we're trying to make on this first part of the of the portfolio construction is the recognition that you as an investor have to take your Hippocratic oath of the do no harm. First, if you have to assume you don't know. And if you don't know, a good way of making sure you don't blow yourself up is through this concept of risk parity, in our opinion, right? And the as problem a with, with presenting that is that you're faced on Twitter, on LinkedIn, with a barrage of what are you doing? This is back in 2012, by the way. What do you think you're doing? What are you doing buying so much bonds? Don't you know that, that inflation is going to hit and rates are going to go up and risk parity is going to be destroyed and correlation between bonds and equities are, are going to uh, go to one and you're going to lose all your money? So there's two things to address there. Number one, uh, risk parity is often thought of as equities and bonds levered, but in reality, it's got that commodity component. And number two, it's, it's the, well, I don't know when that's going to happen. Do you? Do you know when rates are going to go up? And it took a decade for that to happen, right? You had rates go negative. And that bond position in Germany, if you were a German risk parity investor, go up and up and up all the way down to when yields were down negative 75 basis points, right? So it, it's, it's, it was so hard for a decade, people predicting and clamoring for the fact that it makes no sense to own bonds, and yet bonds continue to appreciate in capital and capital appreciation, right? So it's just a, such a difficult game to try to predict the next 12 months, two years, three years. So you, you want to start with that. And then you can start exploring what you can do in terms of tilting your asset allocation weightings, right? But, so it, but it, it's just so room, difficult. The elephant in the room here, right, is, well, great. So we wanted risk parity for, you know, all these different regimes. So, you know, let's, let's review how, how did risk parity weather the 22 environment and what were some of the factors that kind of that, that went into that performance, right? Um, and, you know, 22 was, was a really interesting year because um, we had two pistons of the three that were both hit at the same time, right? For the first time ever we had, well, not first time ever, but in an unlikely uh, circumstance, we had, or unusual, we had stocks and bonds highly correlated and experiencing negative returns over um, a calendar year together, right? I mean, obviously that was extremely painful for traditional portfolios. Did a risk parity portfolio um, navigate it any better? And the answer is kind of sort of, right? I mean, there certainly were some risk parity um, funds or strategies that managed through that inflationary environment much better than a traditional 60-40 uh, portfolio, right? And then there were obviously other risk parity products that either had really emphasized bond duration in order to avoid taking on uh, excess leverage or um, were themselves just highly levered, right? Levered to a higher volatility target in pursuit of, of higher long-term returns that um, experienced a worse year in 2022 than, or you know, call it sort of on par with what a 60-40 portfolio um, 
experience, right? And, um, you know, one big uh, challenge for all portfolios, including risk parity portfolios, is that, you know, risk parity portfolios can handle growth environments, can handle negative growth environments, they can handle inflationary environments. What they, what they can't handle and what no long only portfolio can handle is a massive um, increase in expected cash rates, right? So what did we have in, two, in 2022? We had governments around the world stepping in and um, you know, raising interest rates, raising the level of uh, the yields on cash from you know, effectively 0% to the high threes into the low fours. Now, all of a sudden, when cash is yielding 4%, then all of the other risky assets in the portfolio, whether they're longer duration bonds or credit assets or equities um, or commodities, all of these now look less attractive on a risk adjusted basis um, relative to cash. You know, if you can get 4% on cash with no risk, then you've really got to look uh, long and hard at the the premium you're expecting on risky assets. And so risky assets need to all price lower to be competitive with the, um, you know, much new more cash rate. yield on cash. Adam, right? there's a nuance point to, to the, uh, not just the magnitude of that dislocation in short term interest rates, right? Cash rates, but also the speed. So it is, it, it is the sudden or the, the swift dislocation ahead of market expectations, because you can have an orderly rise that is sort of telegraphed with forward guidance and all of those those interesting tools that uh, policymakers sure. have that can allow for uh, risk assets to to accommodate those changes and for, for, for the changes in asset allocation not to be as disruptive as we saw in 2022. But it really is the surprise numbers that you get, particularly on the inflation front, that then all of a sudden shock market participants well, into realizing that, oh, God, the, the yeah. Fed and other major central banks I, are way I behind the curve. Richard, you're highlighting it's not what actually happens. It's the change in expectations, in expectations. of what is going to happen. Yep, that's, right. that's where markets are priced. They're not priced on the information today. They're actually priced on the expectations of the information in the future. Precisely. And thus, they do have an error rate in those anticipations um you know uh, the pandemic uh, was was one of those very fast the the response of uh central uh banks was another one and you know it's interesting because we've got a couple of questions that i think are worthwhile pausing um yeah. as we talked about risk parity and, and we were actually very effusive in talking about this there's there's a particular r par is mentioned so risk parity it was the first sort of risk parity etf and you had to make a few compromises in constructing that ETF because of the structure it went into. And these are things that investors are always faced with. You have the strategy that you would like to run, and then you have the various delivery mechanisms that you can access that strategy with, and then your client's preferences around how they would like to um, uh, invest in that strategy. And so, you know, um, Mike Harris talks about uh, our par down 23%. So various constructions, even in risk parity, and I'm going to throw this over to you, Adam, to chat a little bit about our risk parity, our par and other risk parities, just as a broad landscape across risk parities, just to emphasize that there is a significant difference in how you might think about the construction, how uh, allocators and managers sort of drove to maybe a little bit less commodity exposure in many cases because they couldn't quite handle the tracking or in the drag. So I'm going to I'm going to lob that over to you to just talk about the whole world of risk parity and how how there's actually quite a bit of dispersion in outcome. And maybe you can talk about why that occurs. And by the way, you know, our risk parity programs had a banner here. They're awesome. So. <laughs> yeah. Um so, yeah, I mean, there's so much variety in, in how different managers construct risk parity portfolios. Some of the major levers that can have an impact in the short term are, are you volatility sizing the portfolio on an active basis? Are you responding to changes in, in volatility in the near term? So if volatility seems to be spiking, you're dramatically reducing total portfolio exposure, or if volatility is declining, 
you're increasing total portfolio leverage, right? Um, different managers approach that in different ways. Um, some managers do respond to changes in, in volatility, but they respond very slowly. Other managers respond very quickly. And depending on the market environment, the slow responders may outperform the quick responders or vice versa. Other managers don't really respond to changes in volatility, but rather just sort of set a long-term strategic allocation based on the long-term volatility of um, the constituent asset classes. And typically for those managers, when volatility spikes, then typically vol when volatility spikes, the underlying asset declines in value. And so, or at least that's true for, um, for equities, especially. And so you can imagine that if you're just trying to maintain a strategic asset allocation and there's a spike in equity volatility, typically that means the equity allocation has, has dropped, which now means you need to rebalance your portfolio. You got to add capital back to equities to bring it back to your strategic asset allocation. So where the volatility responders are selling equities, as an example, they're selling the whole portfolio, but as part of that, they're selling their equities. As volatility rises, the strategic risk parity allocators are buying equities as volatility rises, right? So there's an offsetting um, dynamic. And in fact, the one of the biggest um, strategic risk parity allocators is Bridgewater. And so, you know, they've got well over $100 billion allocated to their global risk parity product. And so while some of the other maybe smaller risk parity funds who are more active in their volatility management are selling, uh, Bridgewater is absorbing that liquidity, which I think probably um, is strongly suggestive that the myth that maybe these risk parity funds or these volatility managed funds exacerbate uh, liquidity events may be overstated, right? Um, there's the there's sandbox course. variable, right? I think we need to sort of maybe the starting point is to, to recognize the universe that we're trading. So if you think about uh, a risk parity strategy that is deployed in a futures universe that is able to access individual commodities and, and not just basket of commodities, which is what you're able to do in an ETS space, that changes. Are you just trading uh, US treasuries or can you access global sovereign complexes? You know. All these different constituents uh, uh, will affect the the, well, the and, and uh, how you're overall. doing it, Richard. I'm going to pile on here because there's the one comment is asking about RPAR, which harnessed a bit of the commodities from the commodity equity complex, which was a bit of the challenge. And that's it's right. not good or bad. It allowed a structure that allowed people to have access to that portfolio, uh, but and they were very clear about how they were going to access that due to the structural limitations. And we highlighted that, you know, well, you've got equity beta mixed in there and it's a bit of a challenging scenario. At times, these things can confound the results that you might like versus what you receive. So, and so, as, as Adam said, and you're pointing out, Richard, there's, there's a lot there, you know, and that's yeah. why you have more than one risk parity manager. If you're and it's all good intentions. You know, everyone's, everyone's trying to make, make the best model that they can to express the views mm -hmm. that their investors are, are looking for with the constraints of the structure that they're offering it with, yeah, right? Precisely. And I, I, I think and that's so, where- we're So just quickly, I do want to land on the risk parity, the close, we can't share our own data because, you know, re regulatory restrictions and all that, but I would say that AQR does something as close as to what we implement internally, like what we believe is, is a good, well-crafted risk parity portfolio where you have your commodity exposure, you have diversity across equities, bonds, and, and so on and, and you know the big thing has always been you guys just wait wait till that till the rates go up and bonds and equities correlate to see how you're just going to absolutely blow up but a well formulated risk parity strategy um and ani if you could just push that screen for me um in 2022 you know you know actually wasn't that bad right that's the yellow the orange line at the bottom there is the all country world index and then the purple line is the AQR risk parity strategy. And what's interesting here is in the first half, remember that commodity sleeve actually did a good job of offsetting the losses of equities and bonds in the first half, right? So in June, by June 6th, that risk parity portfolio was only down 3%. And then commodities started to roll over and it became like a, a tougher period for the risk parity component. But ultimately, 
you know, in one of the worst years where two out of the three Pistons were down in the first half and three out of the three Pistons started kind of going down momentarily, you had a year where risk parity landed down 11, 10 and a half percent. So again, it's not perfect. There are some blind spots and the blind spots end up being when those three Pistons are down, right? So by the way, this is, this is not news to us. This is, if you look at the history, you can recognize that when there's quantitative tightening and when there is, um, uh, you know, liquidity issues and, and people start to withdraw from the markets generally, you're going to need to overlay something on top of your risk parity to fill in the gaps. And what are those gaps that risk parity t tends to have? I would, you know, we've talked about different types of risk. We talk about that risk parity can do well for inflation risk, for growth risk, but does it do well when liquidity dries up? Especially does it do well when there's sentiment shocks, when everything just goes down and there are margin calls everywhere, like in the COVID crisis, and you need to plug that hole when commodities, equities, gold, um, bonds are all going down together, right? So, and even what, before, uh, yeah. even before we do overlay, we, we can just kind of briefly talk about rebalancing and using volatility in your favor. So the idea that you you know you can use uh, the entropy of markets and particularly the entropy that we saw you know much higher in 2022 to your favor and and rebalance the portfolio appropriately. So I, I, I was paying attention to the the equity line that you were showing there, and and, and there were periods where you know the uh, the AQR strategy was up. The, the risk parity strategy was up uh, when, when equities were down and there was an opportunity for investors that are periodically rebalancing their portfolios to switch from one to the other or, 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 or the excess uh, uh, return the that one has premium. had. Yeah, cra yeah. captured the, re the rebalancing premium. So just on the, uh, call it more, more passive, more beta oriented portion of a portfolio, if you do use rebalancing in your favor, you can harness an additional return stream. Yeah. yeah. I think this is a good jumping off point too, to think about a couple of the next uh, steps in part of the thing was at rebalancing, pre pro, uh, rebalancing premium, which you're covering, you know, you, you make a, a VIG for just rebalancing between volatile assets and adding more bets, but in adding more bets, We've got to expand our canvas, and this is hold something on, hold that's on. You know what? Can key I, can to I, parity. I cannot. I can't. I can't help myself. Okay, because because I think. What did I do? There's no, no. It's good. This is good. But I want to the voice. We go, before we, before we go there, first of all, okay. For for Corey, we won't call it a rebalancing premium. We'll call it a, a diversification premium. There you go. You're welcome. Um, and you're right to to force that. Um. I want to talk about another form of, of risk parity or, or what, what goes into risk parity and how we might be able to improve on it, right? So what are we trying to do with this? Well, we've got a set of risk premia, right? Where, where we perceive that risk is, is going to be rewarded. What are those risk I, I like I like where you're going, Adam. And I, I was actually didn't know if you wanted to talk about this. Oh, no. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this is great. But if you if you don't mind, I think we need to address what we haven't addressed is the fact that all of this risk parity conversation requires the use of leverage, which requires the expanding of a canvas of what is the appropriate level of exposure you might think that you need to get from your dollar. And okay, I, wonder, I see where you're going. Yeah. Go ahead, I wonder sorry. if we yeah. might just touch on that first, because I right. think you're I know where you're yeah, going. I so think it's absolutely awesome. But while we're here in risk parity land, what we haven't covered really is this whole idea is if we create a risk parity portfolio and we just have 100 cents on the dollar, we end up with a very large part bond portfolio and with a very small equity tilt. And we kind of end up sort of on the efficient frontier at the you know, kind of lowest vol. It's got a good sharp, but the vol is low and the returns are low and nobody gets excited. So we need to expand our canvas to make sure that we can have these equal allocations of these diversifying risks, which don't increase the actual you know, total standard deviation in all that great effect vis-a-vis -vis the returns that we can achieve. So it, who is it that talks about the size of the canvas? Because that, that, that was a brilliant way to think about it's, it. It's Sam Nomadic from Samuel? Um, Picture Perfect, yeah. Picture Perfect yeah. Portfolio. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so I get full credit to, to Sam for talking about the idea of, a, of a, 
giving your portfolio room to breathe by expanding your canvas, right? For decades, investors have only had a canvas size that's 100% of their portfolio. You put in $100, you have to get $100 of exposure. So we talk about this awesome way of balancing risk between equities, commodities, and bonds, and then people are, get super excited about the concept. They put it together and they, they go from a portfolio, a 60-40 portfolio that runs at a volatility of 12%, that gives a return over a long term of six to eight percent to a portfolio that, because of the diversification, runs at a volatility of four and a half percent and gives you a return profile of three in that in that canvas size that's only a hundred percent. But if you're able to expand your canvas beyond a hundred percent, then you can increase your return profile and get to a point and increase it to the level of risk that you want because the more you increase your exposures to all of them commensurately, you're going to increase returns and risk at the same time. We're not saying go to 20% volatility. If you are happy with 12% annualized volatility, like your 60-40, you're better off getting to 12% volatility with a more balanced portfolio. Now, how do we how do we expand that canvas? Before you had to go to an institution, you had to be an institution, you had to get institutional leverage. Today, as many people here know, um, there are many public mutual funds and ETFs out there. And uh, Corey Hosting from Newfound, uh, myself and Adam wrote a paper in 2021 called Return Stacking Strategies for Overcoming a Low Return Environment. And the, the goal there was that we could use publicly available exchange traded funds and mutual funds that have more than a dollar's exposure for every dollar you give them to be able to create thoughtful portfolios, right? So if you want a risk parity portfolio now, you can actually buy an ETF that has 90% equity, 60% bonds, that has, if you want to start including alphas, you can stack a beta and an alpha and so on. So you can go and look that up at returnstacking.com and, and read on it. But the point here is like what Mike was alluding to is risk parity is not exciting. When, like don't go and test it and be like, what are these guys talking about? Uh, risk parity, gets more exciting if you have an expanded canvas. You can do that now. You can learn about that with return stacking. But I think, Adam, I'll pass it over to you about the idea that risk parity, the basic risk parity is this three risk premia, but maybe we can expand that a little bit more. So I'll, I'll give it. Well, now I feel like the moment's passed. We're already on to return stacking. And, and no, 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 <laughs> no, no. It's, it's not passed. We should have covered it earlier when we started talking about um, the, the whole concept of risk parity, the fact that it requires expansion of canvas. Now that it requires of expansion of canvas, one can go mm. through the different easy ways to do it. But what are the blind spots of risk parity? What doesn't risk parity see that in, you can add to inform it to actually help it produce more informed, better portfolios of betas i mean that's really i think what you're going to get into i'm not sure yeah. but i'm hoping yeah okay well you since you've set up that teaser <laughs> I'll, I'll just go for it um so uh risk parity why does it work well because you're expected to be paid a premium for taking on duration risk right you're going to lock up your money for 10 years or 20 years then you want to expect that you're going to earn a little bit over inflation over that uh time frame versus cash um, which you can take out at any time and it has no risk in your your uh, consumption. You can immediately consume. Um, same with equities, right? Your equities fluctuate. If you're going to take your money out of cash and put them into equities where you want to take it out two years from now, five years from now, who knows? They could be lower than they are today, right? So you need to expect that equities are going to produce a higher return than cash to entice you out of cash. Uh, same for commodities. Um, you need to expect that they are going to do what they you expect them to do in the periods when Commodities are the only thing that you expect to um, deliver, return better than cash. Um, the problem is that sometimes the expectations of there being a duration premium or that equity, the equity premium is higher than what you can earn on cash or that uh, commodities are going to deliver a, a positive return uh, probably should be questioned, right? And 2022 was a really good example. So what happened when the Fed raised interest rates so aggressively, the yield curve inverted. So for most of 2022, the yield or the expected, the expected return on long-term bonds actually was lower than the expected return on cash, right? So you have cash yielding whatever, 3.5%, the 10-year yielding 2.8%, uh, the, the 30-year yielding 3 right? So the, where is that duration premium? Um, if the, the yield on cash is 4% and the dividend yield on US equities 
even the shareholder yield on U.S. equities is less than that, then you know, do you have a positive expected premium there? Or is it as positive as it was when rates were zero? Um, if commodities are in backwardation versus contango, that impacts what you expect. Part of the return you get from commodities is from roll yield, right? So you know, if you've got a commodity where the back months are trading lower than the front month, well, then the expectation is that as the back months begin to roll up to the front month, that they're going to increase in price to converge on the price of the front month contract. That's called roll yield, right? That's a big part of the total return you get investing in commodity futures. If that roll yield currently is negative because your basket of commodities is in contango, then the expected return on that commodity portfolio is negative, right? So what is a portfolio that seeks risk premia in which from the major asset classes um, in whatever direction that premia is currently pointing? Well, that is called a global carry strategy, right? So a carry strategy in 2022, most of the year would have been short bonds. Much of the year it would have been short some equity markets where the expected yield on that equity market was lower than what you could expect to earn on cash. Uh, also, you know, currencies with different inflation adjusted expected yields. You, you, sometimes the US dollar had a higher expected yield, in which case money was flowing from uh, non US dollar assets to US dollar assets and vice versa, right? Commodities spent much of the back half of the year in contango, which implied a low or negative return on, com on certain commodities, right? So, what's interesting is if we look at 2010, 2022, that a global carry strategy actually delivered nice, robust performance. And if you go back as far as we can go with a large global futures universe, that a global carry strategy dominates a, uh, a global risk parity strategy because you're investing in all the same assets, but you're only really long those assets when you're expected to earn the premium that you initially set out to harvest, right? And actually because those those premia, the duration premia, the equity premia, the commodity premia, they typically are, you know, in a positive direction. It's nice to combine a risk parity portfolio with a global carry portfolio. That combination ends up being really magical. So I just want to get allows, that out. The carry, the carry tilted, TV, really. yeah, the carry tilted risk parity strategy is what Adam's alluding to. And that kind of makes it a bit more of a, that's a step forward in the right direction, right? Um, and, and in spite of that, when you put that, that carry tilted risk parity portfolio, you still have a few blind spots that need to be filled in. And my care is, is, is talking about, well, you can short commodities and all this stuff. So we'll get into what you can do, right? So you have when, what blind spots still exist with this type, with what we've put together so far. Well, if you have a prolonged period of, of assets all going down together, you need something that can short. Right. And be reliable in that short have, you know, when you think about what overlay strategies you can do, when you think about liquid alternatives, when people talk about the uh, this space outside of traditional asset classes, you know, still today you hear about, oh, I have a long, short equity manager. Right. And that sadly is just a lower volatility S&P 500 as your, your net long. And you're highly, you're still highly correlated to wherever the S and P goes, or currently being, or maybe not as popular now as it used to be. But private equity, private credit, private real estate, you know, all these. And funds there's some merger are ARB, as, I guess. Merger we hear ARB. a lot. Right. So you're you're looking at those, and you feel like you have you have protection, but as it, as Cliff Asnes calls it, that's just a lot of volatility laundering. It's just a way to feel good about the volatility that you can't see while you own the asset and hopefully get a return, right? But they're not susceptible to a negative growth shock. So when we looked at the landscape of what you can add to go from an all-weather strategy to what we're calling an all-terrain strategy, we needed to have reliable structural strategies that can be net short things or net long everything or net neutral if we need to, right? And that category ends up being in the future space, right? It can be you know, the most popular category is trend following that has been around for decades and has shown time and time again. All you need to do is go, you know, SOC Gen trend index and see how truly non-correlated structurally it is 
to equities and bonds. And it's not that it's you don't need a rocket to be a rocket scientist to understand that the structural diversification is likely to continue to be there because it's when things are trending downward, it takes the opposite side and shorts it and makes money while things are doing poorly and vice versa. And so there is an embedded reason that we can trust that this will be a, a fourth piston in that motor now to help smooth that ride out. Right. And so in the future side, we're not just, you know, from, from our perspective, we don't just think about trend, but trend is, is a very good addition, but we're also looking at things like seasonality and mean reversion and carry and uh, relative value and so on, right? So that is a crucial component to inching yourself toward this all-terrain portfolio, right? Um, and 2022 was a perfect example of that, right? So we just showed you... Um, uh, what's the ticker for, I'm, I'm just going to sell other people's funds today. Um, <laughs> what's the, um, the managed future, a, a well-known managed futures fund, just to overlay on top of the risk parity, um, the AQR risk parity. PQTIX. PQTIX, right? So that's PIMCO, well-known name, right? This is a trend manager. And, and again, it's about filling in the gaps, right? So I'm going to show my screen and, um, and what we see here in 2022 is you have, again, the orange line is, the, is global equities. The purple line did a much better job. Written the, this is AQR's risk parity. And then you have PIMCO's trend strategy or CTA strategy, you know, up 11%. So you have the, the blind spots that exist in that risk parity component are filled in by that ability to short, you know, and, and throughout the year. Look at that quasi mirror image between the AQR fund and the PQTIX fund. Yeah. I mean, talk but that's about kind of the, no that's kind of the goal. That's what you're looking for. Right. And the goal here is to understand yeah. this, this, you can't necessarily depend on this. If you were to take a wide swath of long, short equity managers, you can't really depend on a lot of the same type of characteristics, but in the managed future space, there's a lot, I think there's a reliability to the structural nature of it where you can actually count on long-term you know conditional uh, non-correlation and you saw it last year and this is why it's it's a step forward in building an all-terrain portfolio right so you had this you're kind of flat for the year for that strategy which is better than nothing right yeah i mean the great thing is to um and uh there's we, we leaned on a paper from from man group uh to illustrate this but um you know, commodities are structurally designed to do well during inflationary shocks. And we, if you go back through history, uh, we do observe that over the eight or nine major inflationary episodes of the last century, that the um, commodities, on average, they delivered total returns in excess of inflation, right? So they overcame the inflationary drag that otherwise would have uh, dragged down your consumption power. Um, What's interesting is that you can run a trend following strategy on the same basket of futures of, of commodities. And the, the trend following strategy has a much higher long term historical return than just holding commodities as a long term strategic holding long only. Um, but even during inflationary episodes at diversified trend following also delivered a much higher um, positive boost to portfolios than holding just long only commodities. So it's one of these have your cake and eat it too type situations, which is why a diversified trend following strategy is a key component to an all terrain portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's I'll, another I'll... behavioral uh, aspect to consider here as to why this uh, not so much recently, but over the last several years has been such a hard sell, right? Because people haven't really had to contend with inflation in any meaningful degree. It's been so far outside of the Overton window or the, the conversation has been so detached from any consideration of inflation that people are just like, why would I waste any time having to hedge that risk? And, and I think now the conversation has sh shifted quite a bit, but you still do get, because of conditioning, right? A decade plus long, period of, of people not having to think about this now people are still on the yeah you know what i'm just gonna buy the dip i'm i'm just but i'm just thinking yeah. about that dip as an opportunity we'll see how that ends up if we have another three-year period like 2000 and 2003 right that that period was really 
rough if you were a buying the dip type of investor. Eight dips before you finally bought the final dip. And listen, That's it's not to say seven two oh nine. Yeah, and it's not to say that the 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 behavioral silver bullet was buying CTAs, because from two thousand to two thousand three, those CTAs were up when equities were down, and then gave it all back when equities were up, and you wanted to give up on that one. It's just the whole game's difficult, right? Even if you're putting these things together, it's not super easy to to to, to necessarily get through and. And then there's, you know, when you speak about these broad terms, like it's non-correlated. Well, it's conditionally non-correlated. Sometimes it gets caught, right? And so what's the blind spot, even with this, we got the, this, the uh, carry tilted risk parity, we got the managed futures, it feels like it's complete, but we all know that sometimes if the, if the trends have been up and in favor of equities and bonds for a prolonged period of time, we're going to see that beta risk parity component be long all the risk assets. And we're going to see the CTA and managed futures and systematic macro be long equities and bonds, possibly at the wrong time. Right. And so there's another blind spot where all of a sudden you're conditionally positively correlated to your beta portfolio and COVID hits. Right. What how, how do you mitigate against a complete drying up of liquidity in a very short period of time? And this is kind of the final. The part interesting of the thing there, strategy. too, Rodrigo, yeah. is the covid hit. Well, when did covid hit? December <laughs> yeah, well. of 2019. There was lots of news about this was the classic gray rhino as opposed to the black swan. It was kind of out there. But until it was reflected in price, it wasn't reflected in price. I remember Adam's well, was which it a tweet price, of yours, Mike? Adam. It was a tweet on Fair January point. 29th or something where Adam's like, X amount of cases in China and the S&P just shrugs it off. It was like a, a 9%, you know. That's exactly my in, point. In so January. copper and some of the other base metals, uh, which track, you know, economic activity and particularly, I, I guess, the, the marginal activity coming out uh, uh, from China was more consequential for global economy than any other place. And so those metals and those uh, and some of the other commodities were already starting to, to kill over and reflect. Yeah. Uh, and I think bond markets were, were, were ahead of the game, but it really was uh, the equity market, the, 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 the darling and, and, and what everybody focuses on the last, uh, the last one to get the memo. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's quite typical because if you think about the participants in each of the markets, and this is not all the time. This is just at times. The participants in copper markets are explicitly hedging their copper exposure. They're very connected and integrated into the physical economy. And so you will tend at times to see signals, not always. And this is what makes this business so great. Nothing works all the time. But you're closer to the actual integration into the economy. And sometimes, or at times, that provides a bit of a lead signal, but not all the time. And so this is a really interesting. And then you get the other side of that where all of a sudden the you know global economy is not so strong, but you know, some central bank or some participant is stockpiling some metal. And you're not quite aware of what that commercial interest is. And, you know, it, it's a really sort of interesting, nuanced affair when, you know, people talk about Dr. Copper. Yeah, I mean, it's had some long lead time and interesting signals in the past, but not every time. But there's, there's a structural reason. I mean, it's very yeah. connected to commercial enterprise. Look, that's a great I'm, point, Mike. There are some markets that are much more tethered to economic reality mentals uh. right 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 <laughs> outside of the speculative mania bubble that is right. uh you know the financial markets if you over financialize the economy then i don't know what you know what the, the reflexive what is the nature of that yeah well what you get is you get these massive shocks and and rebounds right these v-type periods that we saw for a long time if you have the financial bazooka available to you without any repercussions from inflation so we saw that for a decade, and uh, and and look, the truth is that both risk parity and systematic macro and managed future strategies get hurt in periods of massive vol vol uh, volatility pickup and whipsaw markets, right? Um, and so, 
look again, this is a, now, now if we think about the, the layers here as preparation rather than prediction, understanding their structural reasons to exist. And now we've created a portfolio of preparation between equities, bonds, commodities, systematic macro. We have one more piece missing. And, you know, that's the 2020 event uh, or 2008, that October 2008 week when everything went down together, a tail protection strategy might be a, a way to go. Right now, luckily, we don't have to do we don't have to hedge 100 percent S&P 500 portfolio that can and will go down in our future 50 to 85 percent if history is any indication. Right. You 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 already have diversity. You have thin tails from the risk parity mm -hmm. side. You have even thinner tails by by stacking on top of that, the systematic macro and the managed futures. Right. So you're already like preparation. Is you're already, already all terrain. It's all you're already semi all terrain. We're just we're just, we're going to try to soup up that that truck. Um, so you are you're already minimizing that black swan event, even the black, the, the gray rhino event. Right. But it's not that there if there is there is the ability to kind of have something that pops. And when everything goes down and you're long, even in your in your managed future side, then the only thing that goes up in that environment is volatility. And so there's there's a wide variety of strategies that you can use in, in the ball space in order to hedge that. Um, and so here I'm going to show like what the character, what that looks like. Right. So I'm, I'm going to um, presentation, share screen. Um, yeah. So if you see this is this is now kind of three indices that are it's just for everybody here to kind of visualize and feel their way through the risk parity component, the systematic macro component at the top there. And then on the bottom right is the Eureka hedge long volatility hedge fund index. Right. And this is just a bunch of managers trying to trying to find the right time to go long volatility and capitalize on that. And the character of these strategies are, you know, it's not fun to stick around most of the time. But when events like October of 08 happen, they have the ability to pop and fill in that gap that you see there in 08 in risk parity, have the ability to pop in March 2020 to fill in that gap that you see in 2020 on risk parity, right? So it's just, it's a nice to have a little tweak in the, in the all-terrain vehicle uh, in order to help minimize even those abrupt events. And, and as Richard alluded to, grab money from the winner get that rebalance opportunity and buy things cheap, right? I so, think that, that, that Rodrigo can't be understated. People say now the time now is the time to buy. And you're like, buy with what? Yeah. Was I fully invested? How was what was I doing? Well, I was I was keeping some cash. You were assuming I was keeping some cash or I came into a windfall. <laughs> well no, I was fully invested because I wanted to capture the risk premiums out there and that's what you, you kind of do. And so not only do you get this really arduous, difficult equity line to deal with in the bottom right corner. <laughs> so it's not that's not an easy equity line, no. let's be clear. But when things go significantly wrong, it's had a tendency to provide the portfolio as a whole with a cash injection where there's been an adjustment in the expected, you know, future returns the future returns had to become higher. So today's price had to go lower. And now we have cash to invest at today's price with higher expected future returns in a portfolio construct. And at least that's the theory, right? This port this piece of the portfolio adds liquidity when liquidity is at a premium. And so it's not just the return itself. It's actually what the return does for the combined portfolio of strategies in order to move from you know all weather to all terrain yeah and 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 i'll say you talk about the equity line on the bottom right as being difficult again like they're all difficult the, the top, they're all difficult but the top <laughs> the top right in the last decade, all of them let's focus be on that one for can i tell second. you guys the truth <laughs> <laughs> yeah but let's focus a little bit on that one because I think this on that because I want to shoot my face. I'm, this is yeah, this is one of the reasons fun. that return stacking is such a crucial concept here, right? Because you go through when does systematic macro and managed futures tend to do well when there's chaos? Chaos leads to dispersion. Dispersion leads to opportunities, and if you X-ray it from a 
number of bets available, you have significantly more bets available to you in an environment of chaos than you do when everything's calm, right? So there was a lot of chaos from 1998, from the Russian debt crisis, through the tech crisis, through the inflationary regime of the 2000s, to the credit crisis of 08, all the way to February 2011, during the peak of the commodity bull cycle. And then from there, you know, central banks cooperate, volatility goes to as low as 6%. You know, there's one winner in town. There's not a lot of opportunity sets. And all of a sudden, this alpha component, you know, this, this absolute return component continues to provide somewhat absolute returns, like positive returns most years, but it's mid single digits for almost a decade, right? Now that, if you have to make room in your portfolio to stick that in there, you're not going to be able to stick to that. But the idea of being able to return stack, to get your like risk parity component, all your beta or your equity or your 60, 40, whatever you want, and then stack that alpha on top. Now, even if you have a year where you're only making 1%, it's an extra 1% that you're stacking on top, right? And so th this is why it's so important to, to now expand that canvas. And it, that expanding of that canvas allows you to more likely stick to the equity line that's on top there, right? So that, that was, that's an important component. The last component is you put these things together, but you stack them on top of each other in a larger canvas so that you're, you don't feel like you're, you're missing out. You get a decent rate of return that's competitive with what people are used to in the equity markets over a long period of time, hopefully. And, uh, and it just becomes an easier thing to do while minimizing the big drawdowns and, and, and being as balanced as you possibly can. Right. So I think that um, all this, we, uh, Adam recently wrote a paper, not a paper, it's a really quick blog post uh, that's three pages long. That, that is, uh, let yeah, me see for, if I can For the CFA, right? For the CFA. And then let me yeah. see. I have it up. So from all terrain to all weather, I think Ani, Ani dropped that You're link there. You're showing white there. charts right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring it up in a second. But um, this is, in, if you go to return, uh, sorry, in, investors all forward slash blog, the, the latest blog post is this one, from all weather to all terrain investing. So if you want to read up a bit on it, the concept, it's a quick read, and it kind of puts it all together for people to, to get an idea as to why we think this is a, a prudent way to um, do the 100 year portfolio. Right. And that kind of ties together everything that we talked about in the master class, everything we talked about today, what our core beliefs are, how we invest for ourselves, our families and our, our clients. And um, and hopefully we get you um, a bit more comfortable with the whole concept and, and bringing all these things together. Anybody yep, else have any see. thoughts? Well, yeah, Mike, Mike uh, Harris was asking us to plot HFRI along or with RP and MSCI. And um, we, I don't have, yeah, we, we yeah. can't easily do that. The uh, HFRI index, I don't think, is in is in that. No, we have, have to download the data app. and plot yeah, it up. So, well, the, um, you know, the, Kevin, think, Kevin is Kevin is in in here as well. And I'm not sure I know Kevin, but I mean, the name Kevin is quite ubiquitous. Which Kevin is it? I, I, I let's go through the Kevins. It's the we? Kevin. <laughs> it's the only Kevin we know on this show right now. <laughs> Uh, a couple of things that I like. Kevin said, you know, nothing works all the time. That's every quant's motto. I, I agree, but it works over time. The other thing in the quant lexicon here at Resolve is that the future reveals what the past has yet to, right? So as much as you torture data, you, we always are very cognizant of he, the future revealing what the past has yet to. And I think that is, if, if there's a motto for quants to have in their mind as they torture data, that is the the, probably the one to keep first and foremost to manage some of the behavioral bias. The other thing is, um, he asked, you know, opportunistically going long vol as tail protection almost seems too good to be true. So maybe, maybe you can, I mean, you know, there's some theoretical Well, here's a, 22 was a great example it. of, exactly. of how yeah. it's not too good to be true, right? I mean, here we had a situation mm -hmm. where stocks went down over 20% globally and, um, Long vol went down at the same time, right? Because we Low just bleed. didn't have those. No vol we just didn't have those vol expansions. Um, so you know, again, just reinforcing this concept that there is no panacea, there is no silver bullet. The um, answer to how do you build a resilient portfolio that 
will stand the test of time is diversify. Don't just diversify across stocks, but diversify across asset classes, include stocks, bonds, and commodities and other potential inflation hedge assets. Balance them so that you're, even though you've got all these assets in the portfolio, if you've got them in equal capital weight, but two of the assets are five times more volatile than the other asset, that other asset's not giving you any diversification benefit whatsoever. So you need to create balance in the portfolio um, and expand your canvas. Expand it to include other risk premia like carry, for example, and potentially uh, other alpha strategies or you know uh, alternative premia or alternative betas like trend and seasonality and other you know there's there's a, a cornucopia of potential uh, diversifying strategies out there if you care to go and look for them and it's really hard to decide or be able to evaluate and make a decision in advance about which of those strategies you should emphasize because the historical data really doesn't give you any clue about what's likely to, to work in the future. So the idea is to find a sufficiently diversified basket of assets and strategies that you have a reasonable amount of conviction in, allocate to all of them in equal risk and stick with them over time. Trying to time them is the devil's workshop. It, uh, it absolutely is wealth destroying. And um, I cannot emphasize enough that, you know, Figure out your diversified basket of assets and strategies, allocate to them in, in an appropriate balance and stick with it for the long term. I'll add, I think what, what Kevin is also trying to get at is opportunistically doing long volatility, I think is the key word that he wants to get at, which is instead of just buying a put option that has a bleed and you're paying for that over, over time and then to get that payoff when you need it, the, the Eureka hedge long volatility index are managers trying to go long ball at certain moments, right? And so, look, the, that's a very good question. And from our perspective, the truth is that that long volatility component is a very small, should be a very small part, because again, as Adam alluded to, we're already well diversified, we're already well prepared, we think we don't really need it. But if we can pull it off, it's a nice to have, right? If you're trying to time going long volatility, and you don't have that persistent put, option, you're going to have less of a, of a negative carry. But you're also going to have a moment where a nuclear bomb goes off randomly. Nobody's going to have time to put in a long volatility trade there. What you're going to depend on is your diversity, right? If that happens, you're probably going to see a lot of money go to treasuries or, you know, you're going to cool. hopefully you're going to be you're going to be hopefully short a bunch of stuff with your systematic macro, right? You're already have a strong base there. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Diversity first and then opportunity second. And so, yeah, there's there's a there's an argument to be made to have a constant put option there. Um, you should definitely think about that. I think if you have if you're overweight growth assets from our perspective, I think we're we feel, feel that this concept is balanced enough where being opportunistic, minimizing the carry and, and taking a shot is a better option. That makes yep. sense. And yes. recognize that any single component to this well diversified portfolio, and sometimes more than one component, can go through a prolonged period of either underperformance or flat performance. I mean, Corey was asking earlier uh, any speculation whether PQTIX or DBMF's volatility has collapsed. And I think that plays into something that we've discussed internally recently, which is this idea that alpha opportunities or, or, or opportunities to, to, to make money, whether it's through trend following or systematic global macro, have been a bit scarcer recently. And, and when that occurs, oftentimes exposures, overall exposures in some of these strategies will be reduced. And because of that, the, the volatility will collapse. And, and, and the, the, I think this reflects the uh, higher uncertainty that we see in markets today, right? Uh, I think the marginal... Uh, dollar doesn't really know where to go yeah i, I think oh I, I i think i think that's a great point richard the, the tails probably have never been fatter at the moment just in the potentialities for markets to kind of process all of the information that's coming at them um yeah whether whether it's it's our bond markets right or stock markets right and how they're anticipating the future it's going to be really interesting to see 
Uh, I think the tails are fatter in sort of general asset classes on their own. But combining those fat tails often leads to, as Rodrigo pointed out, much thinner tails across the portfolio. In the, the short term and the long term. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we close, I want to thank, um, well, everybody you chimed in uh, in the chat, but also especially Mike Harris for the very kind words um, about um, what we do here at Resolve. Yeah, all the and, stuff that we're not allowed to talk about for Yeah, yeah that's right. And, and <laughs> being patient with what we can't, uh, what we can't talk about. <laughs> Um, anyone else want to wrap it up or no, I just think, you know, we're, there's a bunch of stuff that's coming up. A lot of people here know that we, we have a joint venture with, uh, Corey Hofstein. Um, if you want to learn more about that, just follow us on LinkedIn. It's, it's, uh, the website is well, the return stacking website. We yeah. Can return, talk about return stacked ETFs.com. Go visit that. We are going to uh, try and do a podcast with Corey to get into the nitty gritty of all components of that ETF by the end of the month. Sadly, uh, Corey's being very selfish and having a baby. And apparently he's going to try to be a good father baby. for a bit before he joins us. So um, come on, we, we practice this, right? Can we sing it together? Having my baby? <laughs> I don't even, I don't even. <laughs> I I'm Peruvian, man. Is that a, is that a, is that a boomer song <laughs> from Canada? Because I don't know it. Oh, <laughs> I am an Xer. If you want to hurt an Xer, call them a boomer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah that is extra violence right there dude. it's that's, super deep that's yeah. that's definitely violent <laughs> um, um well there's one more question here is there any value using trend and momentum filter with risk parity um, oh you know that was God. that was our initial if you go back to yes of course no there's not yes right oh, like uh -huh. this isn't you know what we'll finish it off with this because we did talk about this in the master class the importance of evolution of research Right. As whenever you, when you, people start as junior quants in this industry, you start with the simple stuff and you, you start putting ingredients in that make sense and you tweak and you try to improve your edge and your alpha, how you construct things. And when we first started in, in the concept of risk parity and wanted to improve it, we indeed decide, decided to do a momentum filter on risk parity. And yeah, that works well. Uh, the paper that we wrote back in 2012 adaptive asset allocation a primer uh, you can look that up um, and and it walks through what happens to risk parity when you add some momentum tilts to it um, we have since graduated from that to keeping risk parity as is and just doing long short multi-factor um, uh, you know as an overlay to disaggregate the alpha and the beta uh, but yeah certainly that is an interesting it's, way to, it, to look at it's it. It's the well. it's the event horizon discussion, which we can maybe save for another day. I mean, it, literally, we could go on for another fifteen or twenty minutes about the idea of multiple antennas and why you would want multiple features and factors that you would be triangulating future price with. And uh, yeah, you just opened a huge can of worms there, Kev. So yeah. We're, we're yeah, not, and multiple done. ways we're of measuring. <laughs> yeah, so and that's, multiple yeah, ways of measuring like, any single one right. of those. Yeah, which I is guess we're saying for another <laughs> hour. Right? See, we we gotta, no, we're not canceling our plans. We'll do this. Yeah, we'll do Look, this. you know what, though? We didn't get to it. So episode nine of the master class talks about the difference between factor beta and then creating alpha and linear versus nonlinear. That is, a, that is a, I just re-listened to it before coming on this podcast. I think it's a very good episode. If you want to it's learn a bit more eight, about actually. alpha and trying to continue episode to strive eight, for that. Richard? Ep episode, episode eight, eight. yeah. Um, well, you, he's you counting in Spanish, so he doesn't know we can't make <laughs> that translation. Right it's fine. Um, so, so definitely listen to that. <laughs> I think the, the key takeaway from that episode is that as you find new alpha, it's already decaying. So you, the, you, the research process has to be ongoing if you're adding new sleeves of alpha to your portfolio, right? So a lot of people in this industry, especially in retail, want want a cookie cutter, you know, recipe that you can look at and make sure they're doing the, the exact same thing. You know, you can do that for risk parity. You can do it for a lot of things. You, you, when, when it comes to actually trying to be different than not than linear based factor investing, then you're going to constantly be changing, upgrading and improving. And uh, that's a key, key component. You know, there's an it's, entire it's a constant hedge fund fight industry the... that's relying on those people demanding those simple rules based strategies that never change. So, just... yeah. We don't want it's to put a constant up. battle against the um, what's it called o orthodoxy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean that that really is where you sit, right? There's 
there's, you know, sort of the common way to think about things, which everyone sits in the bell curve. And then there's, you know, things that are different that potentially can provide excess return. They're not going to be easy and your friends aren't going to be doing them. So you have to think well, long and hard as to whether you have to, if you have the internal fortitude in, in order to successfully harness them because they will be difficult. It's like you say, I love your, what you say, Mike, alpha lives where you don't want to look, right? Exactly. It yeah. lives where you don't want to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Perfect, anyway, great guys. It was awesome to get Jen's a pleasure as always. Next time. Can it. we, can we do anything aside from blues? Are we that boring as resolve? We got our logos blue or all our shirts are blue. You know, a little pink, a little yellow. Wear blue. I would have definitely not worn blue. Well, I've got you know a I, very I colorful like shirt that, that I'll, I'll bring for next time. I, I do and like a hat. I'm worried that Adam, you guys are the always hat. just Maybe falling in line with the boomers. The boomers love when you guys just fall in line. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't have gone there, Rod. I told you not to go there. Yeah. All right. Uh, All right, gentlemen. Good. Thank you, everybody, for joining Happy us today. Weekend, Don't forget to like and subscribe. Weekend. Like yeah, and subscribe. Like we can get. Uh... If you need to find us, just you know, look us up. <laughs> <laughs> you can just Google our names. It'll pretty yeah. much get you there. Click on about in YouTube, and it's investorsall.com. Thanks, all. Thank Cue you. the music. This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for resolve-masterclass.